Seeing as it is our last event, it, at last we get to hear this lecture which we've been promising for some few years, Good Science, Bad Science and the Shroud of Turin, and Dr. Joel Bernstein is going to lead us through that. So, something, a few words about Joel, Professor Joel Bernstein, who's Global Distinguished Professor of Chemistry at NYU Abu Dhabi. After obtaining a BA degree at Cornell University, Joel earned a PhD in uh, in physical chemistry at Yale University for research on the solid state spectros spectroscopy of organic compounds. Uh, following a two year doctoral, uh, postdoctoral stints in x ray crystallography at UCLA and in organic solid state chemistry with Gerhard Schmidt at the Weizmann Institute of Science in Israel, he joined the faculty of the newly established Ben Gurion University of the Negev Way. Until January 2010, he held the Carol and Barry K. Professorship of Applied Science in the Department of Chemistry and is now Professor Emeritus there. From May 2010 until August last year, he was a professor at the newly founded New, New York University, Abu Dhabi, that's us, where he is now Global Distinguished Professor of Chemistry, uh, as I repeat. His research interests center on the organic solid state. Uh, with particular emphasis on understanding and, uh, and utilizing polymorphism, structure property relationships, hydrogen bonding patterns and graph sets and organic conduct conducting materials. He has published over 180 research and review articles and book chapters on these subjects and is the sole author of a book entitled Polymorphism in Molecular Crystals, published by Oxford University Press and translated into Russian. In 1999, he was elected a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and has served as a consultant to many multinational pharmaceutical companies and as a testifying witness in patent litigations on the solid state chemistry of drugs. His, his career has been punctuated by visiting professorships at the University of Illinois, Cornell University, the, the University of Minnesota, the University of Barcelona, the University of Bologna, and as a visiting scientist at the Cambridge Crystallographic Data Center and two years between 2010 and 11 as professor at large at the University of Western Australia, Perth. Interesting title, professor at large in a country where there's so much space. So, <laughs> but he did remind me that today, that this year is the year of crystallography. So it's, it's uh, the podium's here for you. Thank you very much, Philip. Uh, as you mentioned, this, this, uh, this room, this building is rather special for me. I, the first time I came to Abu Dhabi was in, as, as, on an interview trip uh, in early October of 2009. And uh, the building was just being finished. They were just furnishing it. So I saw it then. And in the first class that we gave, on the first Sunday morning at 8.10, we don't give 8.10 classes anymore, the students objected to that. Um, I was actually, I, w I attended the first class that was ever given in this building. And now I have the honor of giving perhaps the last public lecture in this room. So I've, I've had a lot to do with this, with this room. Uh, what I'm gonna do, what I'm gonna try to do today is I, I wanna talk about Good science, bad science, and the Shroud of Turin, and that's maybe an unusual mix. Um, and this, this, this talk developed out of really some, some of the things I had to teach when we first came here. Uh, I, we had students who were coming from all over the world, and I'm a chemist, and I was responsible for teaching first year chemistry here. And so one of the things we felt we had to do was, was initiate people from all cultures and all backgrounds a little bit about what is good science about and what is not so good science about. So we, we spent a number of weeks in the beginning of the first semester here doing that. And in the course of doing that, I learned a lot of what I'm going to tell you now. I became, I became uh, aware of some of the interesting literature on that. And, and the Shroud of Turin was something that had, uh, I'd been fascinated by for many years from a lecture from the person I'm going to talk about in the second half of the lecture. 
So what I'd like you to do is I'm first going to talk about good science and bad science. We'll contrast them. And I'll give you some examples of good science and bad science. And then we'll move on. You'll have then the, the rules about what it's all about. And then I'll give you the story of one particular person's <coughs> research on the Shroud of Turin and let you judge whether that's good science or bad science and, and what you think that has to do with the Shroud of Turin. OK, I assume, maybe incorrectly, that most people know what the, most people in the room are here because they know what the Shroud of Turin is. But if you don't, uh, it's, it's a cloth that's housed in the cathedral in, in Torino, in Italy. And that's the, the image on the cloth that you see in, uh, when, when you look at it in real light. We'll come back to that, but just to remind you what that's all about. So I want to start with uh, what's good science and bad science. And it starts with, with this gentleman, Irving Langmuir. Irving Langmuir was director of research at one of the largest companies that deal with science and engineering in the United States, General Electric. <laughs> he won the Nobel Prize in chemistry in, in, uh, in 1932. He was the first industrial chemist to win the Nobel Prize in chemistry. And he, he, his discoveries and his research were in surface chemistry. And surface chemistry is very important in, in what we do today. That's what makes all these very thin layers that are all stacked up in your computers and your watches and your cell phones and all. It, a lot of chemistry can go on on very thin layers. And, and, and uh, uh, Langmuir was one of the people who developed that. He was very important in the development of chemical theory. And people who know about chemistry, the, the Lewis model is one of those. And Langmuir. Cooperated with, collaborated with Lewis on that. He, uh, another one of his developments was filling incandescent lamps with argon so that it would increase their lifetimes. Hydrogen welding, which is very important in, in, in industry. And the vacuum tube. I don't know how many people in this room remember vacuum tubes. I'm probably one of the few, but when radios and original televisions were all made with vacuum tubes. And at the end of his career, he became very interested in cloud seeding. A really uh, a remarkable person. Now, I'm going to jump to somebody else, Kurt Vonnegut. What's the connection between Irving Langmuir and Kurt Vonnegut? Well, it turns out that Kurt Vonnegut, uh, uh, when, he were, when he went to work after World War II, was a publicist at, Ge at General Electric, and he worked for Irving Langmuir. So he became very, very familiar with it. And Kurt Vonnegut also had a brother who was a very accomplished physicist and had his career in California. And, and those of you familiar with Kurt Vonnegut, who happens to be one of my favorite authors, uh, one of his popular books is, is uh, Cat's Cradle. And according to Vonnegut, Langmuir was the inspiration for the main character in that book. Now, this has to do with our story. Uh, in that book, those of you who are familiar with it, there's something called ice nine, which means a different structure of ice from the ones we put in our various drinks. And, and Vonnegut describes the properties of ice nine. It's more stable than ice 1H, which means hexagonal ice. Uh, and it has a melting point above, way above freezing. And that has very important implications in this fictional uh, account, because it can act as a seed to supercooled water. What do we mean? What, what does that mean? Well, it means that if you have ice nine around and you have water below that temperature, then it would cause all the, all that other water to solidify. And what would that mean? Well, if it started to solidify, then all all the oceans in the earth would freeze. That's all fictional. But you'll see this is related to the story I want to tell you. So that Vonnegut is connected. And that book, remember the date, was first published in 1963. Now, <laughs> Langmuir was a, very, was a very accomplished physicist. This is probably, this is, this is one of the most remarkable pictures. There was a, a conference in Brussels in 1927. 
And those of you who know some of these scientists can recognize some of the greatest physicists in, in the world. There's, the, there's Madame Curie, there's Einstein. Uh, Bragg had already won the Nobel Prize. There's Debye, there's, uh, uh, there's Heisenberg. And, and a, 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 remarkable, a remarkable collection, of, there's Bohr, a mar remarkable collection. They're all physicists. The only chemist who was there was Langmuir. And Langmuir was there, you see he's got a cane. Because Langmuir had been on a skiing trip to Europe, and Brillouin, who was over here, was a friend of his, and so he couldn't go home, couldn't walk. So, so Brillouin said, why don't you come to this meeting? So that's how he got invited, the only chemist with, among all these physicists. But in this, near the end of his career, in December 1953, he gave a lecture on what he called pathological science. And this is the science of things that aren't so. And his examples of, 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 from history of pathological science, these are things no, none of, nobody in the room ever heard of. They died a good death because they were bad science. There are two others that are still alive. Extrasensory perception, there are still many people who believe in that, and flying saucers, of course. And you can get into long-winded arguments about whether they exist or not. I want to tell you about two examples of, of pathological science, which, which we had to deal with after Langmuir died. But first, how did, how did Langmuir define pathological science? What are the characteristics of pathological science? But the maximum effect that's observed is produced by a causative agent of barely detectable intensity, and the magnitude is substantially independent of the intensity of the cause. That means it's very difficult. It's not a very strong effect. So it's very difficult to detect it. But people who detect it honestly believe in it. And it remains close to the limits of detectability. So you need a lot of measurements in order to, in order to investigate this effect and, and, um, and learn its characteristics. But of course, in, to, couple, to be coupled with that is there are claims of great accuracy. If it's very hard to detect, then you say, the people who are involved in this say, well, I, I work with uh, great precision, great accuracy, so I can detect it. But then you have to explain it. So there are fantastic theories to explain these things. Anytime criticisms come up, there are ad hoc excuses thought up at the moment. And it turns out these, these effects that I'm talking about, have a, they, they attract a huge crowd of supporters, which usually rises from the initial discovery or announcement and then decreases to oblivion. So those are the characteristics of pathological science as described by uh, Langmuir. Now I want to tell you about two examples that have occurred in the course of my own career. And there may be a few other people in the room who remember them, but not, I can look around, not too many. The first is polywater. And you can read a, a wonderful book about, about, about this whole story. Felix Franks happened to be one of the great researchers in water. He wrote a three-volume um, compendium on the, chemi on the chemistry and physics of water. Where did all this start? This started with a, 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 a Russian scientist in a rather obscure institute of research in the Soviet Union. In 1962, remember? The Vonica book was 1963. And, but this, nobody knew about this work. What he found was spontaneous water condensation in capillaries. A capillary is a very thin tube under certain experimental conditions. Nobody paid much attention to that. But when he described it, he said the properties differed from those of normal water. So there's water, a new kind of water, and its properties differ. Nothing really happened to that for about three or four, two or three years. And then along came this gentleman, a colleague, a Russian colleague. But he was no slouch. Deryagin was vice president of the USSR Academy of Sciences. And he's a very widely recognized physical chemist. There are many effects and equations and such named after him. And so he, he commanded a lot of respect. 
And he was, he was in, in Moscow at the, at the Soviet Academy of Sciences. So he picked up on this discovery, and he took over the research in 1966. And he said he perfected a, an experimental technique for the production of polywater, which he called condensate. Now, he, he, he could get enough of this condensate so he could measure the properties, and he published them. And so I want to tell you what the properties were, and then what we know is the properties of normal water. So the freezing point was much lower than normal water. This is zero degrees. This is much below zero degrees. The boiling point was much higher. This is 100 degrees centigrade, and that was much higher. Notice it's in a range. When we measure these things, we know an exact number. But they, could, they didn't get an exact number. They got a range of numbers. That says something about the nature of the science. The density was about 40% higher than normal water. The thermal expansion coefficient, that means how fast it expands it as you raise the temperature, is one and a half times the normal water. This, <coughs> this created a huge amount of interest. And one of the people who picked up on this was this, was this gentleman, Jerry Donahue. Who is Jerry Donahue? Jerry Donahue is mentioned in Watson's book describing the discovery of the double helix. And if any, anybody, if you, if you haven't read this book, I highly recommend it. It is a marvelous read, and you don't have to know a lot of science. And Watson is still around, and, and this is a wonderful story. But Watson describes Jerry Donahue. And what does he say about Jerry Donahue? As he says, next to Linus Pauling, who was in the race for the double helix with, with Watson and Crick, Jerry knew more about hydrogen bonds than anybody else. And Jerry Donnie, who was the guy who gave the key to Watson, especially Watson, not so much Crick, but Watson, on how to put the DNA together. The final, the final piece in the puzzle was due to the fact that, that Jerry Donahue corrected Watson's ideas, which were wrong. Watson had the wrong idea about how the base pairs in DNA should go together. And Donahue was a postdoctoral fellow from Pauling's lab at Cavendish Laboratory. And he happened to be around. And he walked over and he looked at Watson's thing. He said, you got it wrong. You got to change that. And then Watson got it right. So, so Donahue was a key player there and, and became one of the real experts in what we call hydrogen bonding. And that's the way mo water molecules stick together by hydrogen bonding. And Donahue got into the polywater game. A lot of good scientists were in the polywater game. Here's the, the, published the structure of polywater in science. Interesting, the abstract. I love the, the wording in here. This structure contains features which are less unattractive than those which are part of several earlier models. Less unattractive. Not uh, more attractive, less unattractive, right? OK, so Donahue had these structures, published one paper in Science in 1969. So we're moving along. The first discovery in 62 or in 1969, a lot of people are worrying about polywater. And it's being published in Science. <clears throat> By 1971, it died. And how did it die? It died because these two gentlemen, Leland Allen and Peter Coleman, who were at, Leland Allen was a professor at Princeton. And Peter Coleman was a postdoc of his at Princeton. They were theoreticians. And they wrote a paper here in, in Nature. We present here new results that disprove a widely discussed and seemingly successful structural model for polywater. OK, so, but what's reference one? Reference one is to another paper of theirs. So what they're saying is they are now going to present a theory, or, or they're now going to present a, a, a re refutation of a theory that they themselves had developed. And they, they write, we have placed ourselves uh, in the unusual and all too easy to discredit position of being authors on both the original model and the new results against it. Very rare. And, but you see what happened to them. This is something we'd all like to have. They got a pa paper in science and a paper in nature. And on their CV, who the, who the hell knows what, whether that, they, that one is a, mis is a correction of an earlier mistake. So it looked real good on their CV. This reminded me, by the way, 
of a wonderful a quote I'm very, very, uh, I like very much from, from J John F. Kennedy in 1962. He was, he was given a, an honorary degree at Yale and he said, it might be said now that I have the best of all possible worlds, a Harvard education and a Yale degree. <laughs> and <clears throat> that's what they, these, got, these got, two guys got a paper in science and a paper in nature. That was the end. That was the demise of Polywater. 20 years later came cold fusion. And <clears throat> this started, I remember where I was at the time I heard, first heard about this. I was riding in a car in Los Angeles, and this came over the radio. There was a press conference in Utah. Two scientists have successfully created a sustained nuclear fusion reaction at room temperature in a chemistry laboratory at the University of Utah. Now, fusion, for those of you who don't know, is not like, normally when we talk about an atomic bomb, that's fission, that's atoms splitting. But fusion is putting atoms together, and you need a tremendous amount of energy to do it. It is not easy to do that. But these two, these two gentlemen said they had done it. And so, what was, what was the press? It was the greatest invention since, since the discovery of fire. Now, <clears throat> It became an instant media, media event, made the cover of Time magazine. And I love the cover here, now, how two obscure chemists stirred excitement and outrage in the scientific world. Two obscure chemists. And Fleischmann was an Englishman, a fellow of the Royal Society, and Pons was the chairman of the chemistry department at the University of Utah. I would like to be as obscure as Fleischmann. That's, <laughs> But Pons and Fleischmann, they were interviewed on all the TV networks. And U.S. Congress had, had hearings on, on cold fusion. This was a big, a big hit. What were they trying, what were they claimed they had done? They claimed they had this little cell, each one of them holding the cell. In that little cell, they could do what other people were trying to do to build this tokamak to do real fusion. And it, just to get an idea of the scale, these are people here who are working on this instrument that these guys said they could do in this test tube. There, was a lot of, there were a lot of attempts to, to prove and disprove this. In the end, it didn't go anywhere. And Pons moved to France in 1992. Toyota put a lot of money into it for a number of years. Pons had to be, give up his citizenship. And Fleischmann, he's still alive, but Fleischmann died a couple of years ago. He was home in England. And it ended. Two examples of bad science. I want to move on to another example that has a lot of the same characteristics, but a different ending. Uh, Heike Onnes was a Dutch physicist. And in 1913, he won the Nobel Prize in physics. For what? He was the first to make liquid helium. Now, to make liquid helium, you have to take helium down to a very, very low temperature. It's four degrees above absolute zero. And he managed to do it. And as a result, he, when he was using liquid, liquid here, he discovered a, a, an effect called superconductivity. And superconductivity, of a, we're, we're, com, we're starting to use that. Superconductivity is an effect where the resistance of a metal, say, that becomes superconducting goes to zero. So if you put electricity in there, it goes around and around and around and never stops. A lot of interesting things you can do with that. And that was discovered in 1911. <clears throat> How and why it works wasn't really understood. People, did, a lot of physicists did a lot of work on that. And one of them was a man named John Bardeen. John Bardeen was the only person who won the Nobel Prize in physics twice. And there he is. A, 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 an interesting personal sidelight. When I got to when I got to my freshman dormitory at Cornell in the, in the fall of 1958, the guy living across the hall was Bardeen's son, and it was his father won the Nobel Prize. So <clears throat> there was he's a pretty good physicist himself these days, Bar, Bardeen's son. But he won the Nobel Prize for the invention of the transistor in 1956, and then he won the Nobel Prize in 1972 for explaining superconductivity. And that theory was called the BCS theory. And the BCS theory said 
superconductivity could not occur anywhere above 10 degrees Kelvin. Can't be. That was, and for that theory, they won the Nobel Prize. And for 75 years, nobody found any material that was superconducting above 10 degrees Kelvin. Sorry? Like above 10 degrees Kelvin. So they deserve the Nobel Prize. In 1986, along came these two gentlemen who were physicists in, at IBM in Switzerland. And they published this paper, Possible High Temperature Superconductivity in This System. And what did they say? They, they didn't have a press conference. They didn't make a lot of noise. They went and did their work and published it in a scientific journal. And they said, the highest onset temperature is observed in the 30K range, which means they were 20 degrees above the limit that any, everybody else had found and that the Nobel Prize winning physicist had said was the limit. You cannot have it. The theory said there's no way. And these guys found it. And what was the difference here? The difference was they published this graph. It was easy to, you could, see the, you could see their numbers. And it was even easier than that because they published the procedure. Here's the sample preparation and characterization. And I remember, I remember very well what was going on at this time in 1986. This, this, the manuscript of this paper was being faxed all over the world. And all of us were going down into the laboratory and making this stuff and measuring it. And it worked. It worked for everybody. And, and that's what made the difference. This was good science. Everybody could repeat it. And these guys were given the Nobel Prize in physics in 1987. So there you have, a year after, so there you have some bad science and some good science, and you can see the difference. Sometimes it's a little fuzzy. But there was no question here that they had a discovery that everybody else could repeat. Now I want to turn to the Shroud of Turin. And here's what it looks like in some photographs. The photographs aren't all, uh, aren't all the same. And, but what, made the, what makes this very dramatic is not, is not the, the, the photograph itself, is, but when you have a, a negative that's been contrast enhanced. And it's a very dramatic picture. And I think this is what we all think about when we think about the Shroud of Turin. There have been many, many books on the Shroud of Turin. Many books. And, but uh, one, of, one of them is authored by a man named Ian Wilson who had a, had a role to play in the story I'm going to tell you. And this also is in the popular press. 1998, this came out Time Magazine, it made the cover of Time Magazine. And that was the, that was the beginning of, of the article. Let me just read this to you. The relic was declared a, f a false, uh, false a decade ago, but millions expected to, to venerate it, inspired by those who, who, who say there's truth to back their faith. So there's, do you believe in it or you don't believe in it? Is it real or not? And that's one of the major questions that surrounds this. Where does this all come from? A shroud is, is a piece of linen that's used to wrap the body of a, of a dead person. And, and, and in the New Testament, in the Gospel of Mark, Joseph bought a linen shroud and taking him down, that's Christ from, from the cross, wrapped him in the linen shroud and laid him in a tomb which had been hewn out of rock. And he rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. So, the Bible tells us that Christ was, was wrapped in a shroud before, before he was buried. And where is that shroud? <clears throat> there's a tremendous amount of information. You can be inundated with it. And there's a website on this uh, if you're interested. But you just get an idea of how many people visit this website. Now, what's the story? What, what, what are the, some of the facts about, about the shroud? And here I'm not taking it, not what I say, but what comes out of that website. The general consensus of even the most doubting researchers accepts a 1350 date as the beginning of the undisputed or documented history of the Shroud of Turin. 
The first documentation of the shroud came, uh, was, was in France. Now, the shroud was, was exhibited in 1978. That's 45 years after the previous time it was taken out for the public to view. It's not, it's not on view all the time. And then what happens is people line up to see it. In 1978, three and a half million people lined up to view the shroud, which is housed in the cathedral in Turin, Italy. And you know, in order to, in order to justify putting up a church, you have to have some relic from the life of Christ or one of the saints. That's what helps bring the faithful in. And the, the, the shroud is the treasure of the cathedral of Torino. <clears throat> in January of 1974, and I'm going to get to Walter McCrone in a minute, I'll tell you more about him. As a result of his work on the Vineland map, he was invited by Ian Wilson, who wrote one of those books, to study the shroud. Now, I don't know how many of you know about the Vineland map. I won't go into it. So is there, anybody know about the Vineland map? The Vineland map it was a map that shows the area in the northeast, of, of north, northeast part of uh, North America. And uh, it was dated in about the 14th century, before Columbus came to America. And so it was, it was said that this was a map that the, that the Danish explorers, Eric the Red and his, his, and, and his, his crowd, they got to North America before Columbus did. And Yale University got a gift to purchase this map for about $2 million back in the early 70s. And they wanted to verify it. So they asked this man, um, Walter McCrone, to verify it. And Walter McCrone, as you'll see, does almost all of his work on a microscope. And what he found on the Vineland map was traces of titanium dioxide as white paint. And it turns out, titanium dioxide was not used as a pigment. It wasn't even known to man until 1920. So he declared it a fake. There's still, there's still a lot of controversy about it. And if you go to the Rare Book Library at Yale, which is an absolutely gorgeous building, I suggest you go in and take a look at the map and judge for yourself. It's, it's, but it's still there. And, and there's still some controversy about whether it's genuine or not. But that's where he got his reputation, McCrone. OK. And, what it, what it, as, and Ian Wilson, the author of that book, wrote to McCrone, the image of the body is extremely subtle. You can see it here. Yet if significant results could be achieved from your tests, such as physical or chemical causation of the shroud imprint, how is this image made? I'm sure the necessary financial means could be found. We got the money. You do the work. In response, McCrone wrote, you may be pleased to hear that we don't find all objects entrusted to our microanalytical care fraudulent. Sometimes we find that they're real. We would be very interested in the study of the shroud and hope that it can be arranged. Now, a key, McCrone wrote a book about the, this whole story, and one of the key players in this was this, <clears throat> what he called Mr. Shroud, uh, Monsignor Rinaldi. And he was, as he describes him, Macron describes Rinaldi, a remarkable man and the author of several fine books on the shroud. He was an effective ambassador for the, shroud, the shroud in the church, immensely helpful to scientists. Without him as a guide, counselor, moderator, and friend, we would not have had the opportunity for scientific study of the shroud. He fought hard for an opportunity for the scientists to study the shroud. He fought even harder to protect the sanctity of the shroud from scientific attacks. Real dichotomous kind of uh, behavior. And Macron dedicated his book to uh, Monsignor Rinaldi. And there's Rinaldi with the shroud and the negative image. So you get, a, again, get an idea of what it, what it looks like. Now, in, in August of 1974, Macron wrote to Rinaldi, it would be a tremendous accomplishment if the shroud could be dated and a date near the time of Christ would certainly lend considerable weight to the evidence that is, it is indeed the shroud of Christ himself. So, so Macron 
was rather excited about the, the, the possibility. It is also important to determine the nature of the image on the linen. If the image and the stains that form part of that image are shown to have been caused by body fluids, this would be further authentication. Finally, success in these two areas, the date and the presence of body fluids, those two aspects, would then make it very difficult not to conclude that the shroud is indeed that of Christ. So you can see how he started off. He started off, essentially, he may not say a believer, but with hope that, that that's what he would prove. He hadn't done anything yet. <clears throat> and in, a couple of years later, in September of 1978, th there was a group set up called STIRP, the Shroud of Turin Research Project, and they invited Macron to join. So now Macron was part of an official group that was going to carry out scientific studies to investigate the Shroud. So who was Walter Macron? <clears throat> Well, I want to go back over 100 years ago to a, man, a professor of chemistry at Cornell named, uh, named Emile Chameau, and he created the field of chemical microscopy. And what is chemical microscopy? It's doing chemistry under the microscope. That's what it's all about. Not in te big test tubes, under the microscope. And Chameau had a, had a PhD student named Clyde Mason, who got his PhD about 25, 27 years later. And they, he, the two of them wrote a book which is still in print in, 19, in the 1920s, a very, a, a very useful book on how to do chemical microscopy. And Mason had a student named Walter McCrone. He got his PhD at Cornell. I can, ju just as an aside, Clyde Mason was still teaching w at Cornell when I was a freshman there. I didn't, I, unfortunately, I didn't take his course. I wish I had. But McCrone... Macron was a very special character. He published 600 papers and 16 books. He could identify in a microscope on site over 30,000 different substances. Now that may sound ridiculous, but if you think of his, he spent many, many hours looking under the microscope. But think about what you, just look around the room and see how many things you recognize just by looking. You're, we're all accustomed, this is our macroscopic world. His was microscopic, so he could identify many, many things. And he, he actually did that, used that knowledge to write what's called a particle atlas. When you look under the microscope, this is what particles of this, this material look like. And <clears throat> he made a lot of money, a lot of money. And what he did was, Chameau had left some money to Cornell for an endowment, but it wasn't enough. And, and, and uh, Macron completed the endowment. An endowment at Cornell, I think, today cost, well, I don't, when he did it, it cost somewhere around $2 million. So he gave a lot of money to Cornell to set this up. There's the, there's the Chameau professor in analytical chemistry. Okay. And Macron had established, not only with the violin map, but everything he did. Uh, people who study, I don't know if there's anybody in this room who's studying um, art history and the verification of art objects, Anyone who's gone through a graduate program in conservation knows him, his name. He has his pigment handout. Pigments are the, the colors that are used in, in uh, paints. Or their teacher was taught by him. That's a quote from the, uh, a woman from the Museum of Modern Art. In your first year, it's Macron, Macron, Macron. He played a major role. This guy was a very important person in, in, the, whole, in the whole field of, of, uh, of art conservation and verification. So in 1978, the STIRP, the committee, decided to take samples from the, from, from the shroud by using sticky tape, scotch tape, and they lifted off samples of the fabrics from the, from the shroud. And this is where all, the, all, these, all these sticky tapes had been located. Just to get you oriented, there's the face, and we're going to talk quite a bit about this, this, this sample right here. So these samples were taken and given to Macron to investigate. <clears throat> now, the, a lot of, most of this story, I want to tell you where it comes from. Macron wrote a paper in 1990 in what's called Accounts of Chemical Research. Just to let you know, this is what's called a peer-reviewed article. That's a high, that's a very high impact factor. We'd all like to be publishing, right, provost? 
<laughs> we don't like to be publishing in journals that have impact factors like that. And he wrote a book called Judgment Day for the, for the Shroud in 1999. So this is where what I'm going to tell you is, comes from these, these two, mainly from these two publications. Okay, so Macron's got these tapes, and he sets out to work on them. Christmas Day, 1978. And he kept a, he was a good scientist. That's cheating on you. But he, 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 kept, he kept a very good notebook, which is, which is extremely important. One of the things that we try to teach our first-year students. So here's his notebook entry from Christmas Day. You can see December 25th. You don't have to read it. I'll make your life easy. This seems to be an appropriate date to start the study of the tape. My objective is to find what the image is. This is word for word. It is visible. Therefore, it has atoms. And we should be able to analyze these atoms. This should tell me what makes. I even crossed out and I put that in for you. Makes up the image and perhaps how it got there. Most likely, it will turn out to be the body fluids yellow, yellowed by age. It is well known that almost any organic fluids with time, varnish on paintings, for example, underarm, yes, underarm perspiration also obviously yellows the cloth. In any case, I will begin by examining representative tapes by polarized light microscopy to see what I see. That's a rather positive outlook, yeah? And we're talking about now December 25th. Almost immediately, there were surprises. December 26th, the next day, starting with 3CB, I showed you where that sample came from. A heavy image area, that is, what does that mean? On the, on the shroud, that's a place where there's, where there's an image, not a place where there's not an image, okay? That's why he took that one. Blood, there's blood from a lance wound, because, because uh, from, when, from where Christ was nailed to the cross, there, would have been, there was blood, at least all the pictures show us that. Using low magnification, that's important, that's 100, 10 times 10 is 100. I could see heavy encrustation of blood, question mark. It's too red. I've never seen dried blood look like this. The sample we use for the particle atlas is spray dried, but it's yellow to black depending on the thickness of the particles. Why is this blood different? I'll check more tapes. The particles with higher magnification and different kinds of illumination. So he's using all the techniques that he knows of how to change the conditions for observation under the optical microscope. A week later, I have looked pretty carefully at almost a dozen of the tapes and find plenty of red particles, all like the blood, still with a question mark, on 3CB. That's the same sample. The amount and degree of aggregation varies considerably when blood clots it aggregates. There's a great deal of, on, on this finger, that's another, other samples, both right side wounds. There seems to be less on purely body image, which, which shouldn't have blood. But there's some, that is in the right calf, lots of small red particles. Now he's going to try to identify them. Remember, he could look at particles. He had a wonderful way of doing that. He had learned an awful lot in his years looking under a microscope. And after a month of additional work, we're now into February, I have spent a lot of time looking at the tapes, especially the red particles. There are a lot of them. And they are definitely inorganic. Inorganic. Blood is organic. <clears throat> Hundreds of fibers are well coated with these deep red particles. They are very likely the same particles that somebody else, another group, show in their low power photomicrographs. He looked at them in high ma magnification. They this say this is blood. I say it is an inorganic ca compound. So he's had, he's had, as a result of what he's seen, he's had to change his view of things. Another month later, I carefully examined sample, another sample, and found many clumps of, this is iron oxide, hematite, very tiny particles. This sample is blood from the wrist. We should prepare ourselves for a negative finding, read the shroud. So in three months, a little even less, his view had changed on the basis of what he had observed. Now, he was a chemical microscopist. Said he did his work on the, on the microscope. So what observations did he make and what chemical tests did he do in order to carry out this examination? Well, you have to think, what are the scientific questions you have to ask before you start doing an experiment? That's what it's all about. So 
one of them is what is the source of the color? It's color. He said it was color, and we can see it's color. Are the image and non-image areas different? If the pigment is found, what's its chemical composition? Is there a difference between image areas and blood image areas? Because everyone knows that you have the body, and then there are places where, presumably, Christ bled. And if it was a shroud that covered his body, there should be blood in those areas. And that should, that should be different from the rest of the body. <clears throat> can, can all the analysis be confirmed by other methods? Good science or bad science? How was the shroud created? Major question, still being debated. So, okay, so let's go through these questions. What's the source of the color? Now, if you just look at the, if you look at this with the unaided eye, the shroud image is yellow in most of the body image areas. We could see that. I, I haven't left the background on it, but that's what you can see. It's sli slightly yellow. In the in the it's in the blood image areas, it's red. So there are two different colors, and you can see that with the naked eye. Under the microscope, it turns out that the yellow fibers, the the image, this image consists of yellow fibers. That's what, that's what comes from here under a microscope. You can see a little bit of yellow. The color didn't come out as, as well as I would have liked. And red particles. So that's when you look at it under the microscope. We still don't know what they are. We've confirmed that they're yellow and red. So what's the source of the color? Now, he had 32 tapes. So he examined 22 image tapes. That is, tapes that were on the body or on the blood area. And 10 non-image. So if there should be a difference, right? Because one, one is, uh, is taking material off the image and the other is taking just material off the, off the cloth. The tiny red, there are tiny red particles in the body and the blood image areas, red. But there are no red particles in the non-image areas, which makes a lot of sense. What's the conclusion? The red particles make up the image. I don't think you have any trouble with that, okay? Now, it turns out that you need not 100 power ma magnification, but somewhere between 600 and 1,000 to see it. And not everybody who looks at it with a microscope uses that power of magnification. But what's the source of the color? He examined more than 8,000 fibers. That's a lot of looking under the microscope. Now, remember, this is all on a piece of sticky tape, and you just move it around and take notes and, 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 and uh, about what you see. On the average, 19% of the yellow fibers in non-image areas, and in the image areas, 46%. So what's the conclusion from that observation? The image was applied as a liquid suspension, some paint, and a paint media that might yellow with time. What's a paint media that might yellow with time? Sometimes they use egg white or, or other organic media. And that could yellow just like sweat could. So here's from the shroud with high magnification. This is what he saw. What are the red particles? You know, there's some red particles and there's some yellow particles. They were on all the image tapes. All the image tapes. It turns out that from his knowledge, the color the hydration, how much water is in there, and the refractive index, that's a, that's a number that tells you how much light is bent as it goes through the crystal. They're characteristic of red ochre, an artist pigment used by humans for 30,000 years. That's the pigment that's used in the caves of Lascaux in France. Same thing, and, and human beings have been using that for thousands of years. Now, how, do you know, how did he know that that was red ochre? Well, yellow ochre turns to red ochre with loss, of, with loss of water over time. This is chemistry that's well known. And this was confirmed by two other analytical techniques. He could identify it by looking at it, but he wanted to confirm it. So <clears throat> what he did was he went out and bought modern red ochre. You can buy it from Forbes, a company that makes pigments. And if you look at these crystals here and look at these crystals here, they're identical, same stuff. <clears throat> the red particles are submicron in size and opaque by transmitted light with high refractive index. So they're, 
that, that's, one, that's one of the proofs that it's red ochre. What about the blood image? So we've, got, we've taken care of the body image. What about the blood image? Well, a 220 power, that's what it looks like. And it contains red particles, which are different from those of the red ochre. And you could see that by the shape and the refractive index. And it turns out that he recognizes his characteristics of artist pigment, vermilion, mercuric sulfide. Now, there are three types of mercuric sulfide. And if you're good at this, you can identify which one is which just by looking at them. He could do that. And the, the type that he identified was first prepared by alchemists in 800 AD. It's a very nice red pigment. 800 AD, AD is what? Anno Domini. That's 800 years after Christ. Okay? But he wanted to prove that it was mercury. So how did he do that? <laughs> one, of the, one of the methods, this is a lovely experiment. I heard him talk about it and it was fantastic. One of the, if you put mercuric sulfide on a copper penny, then the mercury, which is in the mercuric sulfide, is what we, the chemists say it's reduced to the metal. And I don't know if any of you know, most of you probably know that mercury is a very shiny liquid. And so if you put it on the copper penny, that's what you get. You put this, the, you put, he put those particles, he took them off the shroud, and he put them on a copper penny, and he got the mercury mirror. That proves that it's mercury beyond any shadow of a doubt. So the red pigment, which was in the blood areas, is, is vermilion, merc mercuric sulfide. <clears throat> now, different samples of the paints of blood areas show varying ratios of red ochre to vermilion. So, but there's no vermilion pigment in any of the thousands of body image fibers. No vermilion pigment in any of the, So the body has no vermilion, only in the areas that were meant to show blood. So that, what's the conclusion? It was painted with ochre, and then the blood images were enhanced with vermilion. So far, so good. Now, you could say, but red ochre, which is iron oxide, could be formed from blood, because all of us have iron in our blood, right? Hemoglobin, that's what it is. So, so maybe the iron came from blood. But there's no biological source for mercury sulfide. Thank goodness we're not walking around with mer mercury sulfide in us. We wouldn't be walking around. <clears throat> if it's a painting, then what's the medium for the paint? Those are the pigments, but what's the medium for the paint? Now, there are things that, that humans have used for paints. They're drying oils, gums, and tempera. These are generally organic materials. And he found evidence for paint residues on the fibers, and you can see them. There's paint residue there, and there's paint residue there. So you test the paint media and the blood for composition of, of these residues. And, and these, are, these are chemical tests, which you can do under the microscope. So the bromocresol test, it's called, was negative. Therefore, drying oil was not used in the paint. Similarly, what's called an orsine test, was negative, so no gums were used in the paint. Rules it out. <coughs> Protein, which, is, which would be the basis for something like, let's say if egg yolk was used or something like that, gave thin stain residues. So he carried out a proof of concept experiment. He pre prepared two possible paints. One that's made up of blood, and another that's made up of collagen. Collagen is, some, is, is the material we have between our bones. So you, it's usually taken from animals and, and used as a basis for paints. With 10 parts per million red ochre in a 1% solution. So there's these two. And the idea was to test if the paint was one of these, which one would it be, if possible? Would it, would it be similar to, what, to the image on the, on the shroud? And he got an artist to paint the linen on the test strips. So here they are. This is a test strip with blood, and this is a test strip with the pigment, okay? Now, which one, you look at it, you're just as good as I am as looking at it. If you look at it, does that resemble the image, or does that resemble the image? Clearly, this one is much closer to what the image looked like than that. There are no these spots with rings on the, 
on the, on the image. So the, the blood doesn't work, the iron earth pigment does. So that's, that's another indication that it was made with pigment. The paint from the red ochre produces fibers indistinguishable from the shroud fibers that test for collagen as above. So if you look at this, and, and then you look at these fibers, they're exactly the same for the shroud and from this sample. So an independent proof. <clears throat> now, can we find blood on the shroud? Even given all of that, that so far none of the paint None of the painted images appears to be blood. He tested the blood image area tapes from the right lance wound on, on one of the hands. Now, there are four different tests for blood. And if you work on a microscope, you know how to do them. They were all negative for blood on the shroud. Not a single test gave blood. All four. <coughs> and... But if you use the same test on the proof of concept strip, the one that gave the little round circles, that shows positive for blood. Confirmation that the test shows what he expected it to show. If it's blood, it'll show up. If it's not blood, it won't show up. And there were no particles of index of refraction, again, how it bends light. <clears throat> and that's the value you get, you expect for blood. And he could go from particle to particle and check the index of refraction, and he never found any that had the appropriate index of refraction. No evidence for blood. One more important chemical test. Blood has two amino acids, they have similar names, cysteine and cysteine, which are not present in collagen. Okay? So the microscopic test for blood, if, you, if you're looking for cysteine, will show bubbles, and that's what it looks like. So if you have, if you have blood and it's got either of these two uh, compounds in there, which, should be, which are components of, the, of blood, then it gives these, these are bubbles. Very easy to see on a microscope. You just do it, you put a drop on, get bubbles, it's blood. And if you take the synthetic bubbles, the synthetic blood paint that Macron had, it shows the bubbles, just like you'd expect. That's what he got. But, the fiber from the shroud shows no bubbles, no blood. <clears throat> now, that's all the tests, the chemical tests there are. We, we went through the whole list of what you had to prove. And, you, and so the question is, well, if, if it's not blood, how was it painted? How, did they how was this shroud created? So we have to go back a little bit in history to the beginning of the first, beginning of the 19th century to this gentleman, Sir Charles Locke Eastlake. I'd never heard of Sir Charles Locke Eastlake either, but this was a quite an interesting man. He was an English painter, gallery director, and collector and a writer of the early 19th century. There were a lot of those in, in, in those days, but he was the National Gallery's first keeper. He was the first director of the National Gallery of Art in the UK. So he, played a very, he had a very important position, and he knew a lot about art. He was an authority. And he got an honorary degree from Cambridge in 1864, so he was highly regarded. And he wrote a book two volumes bound in one, Methods and Materials of Painting of the Great Schools and Masters, Sir Charles Locke Eastwood. He was knighted also. And in this book, he describes in chapter five, this process of how, he, did, he wasn't talking about the shroud at all. He was talking about process, a way of painting that was practiced in the 14th century. This process was called the English or German mode of painting, grisaille. Did I get it pronounced right? Grisaille, yeah? After this linen is painted, its thinness is no more obscured than it, it had not been painted at all, as the colors have no body. Yeah, the colors have no body. The peculiarity of the English method appears to have been a, its absolute transparency. And you know what? The image of the shroud is almost transparent. A manuscript of the time, that is the 14th century, contains directions for the preparation of transparent colors for painting on cloth. These are all quotations from the book, okay? 
The Anglo-German method, the Grisai, appears from the description to have been in all respects like modern watercolor painting, except that fine cloth duly prepared was used instead of paper. So that's how the shroud, he says, Macron, following this, this description, how it was, uh, how it was uh, uh, painted. Now he says, his conclusion from that, it now seems reasonable that the image now visible was painted on the cloth shortly before the first exhibition or about 1355. The period is right, and the historical record is, is uh, in concert with that. I believe the, shroud, the Turin Shroud is in its entirety a skillful and scholarly work of art. Now, you remember, you remember how that article in, the, in Time magazine started out? A forgery? He never said it was a forgery. In fact, he says it's a beautiful medieval painting. He had great respect for this piece of art. And he set out to prove that it was a shroud. But the, the facts and the results of his experiments led him to conclude otherwise. Now, remember the history. We go back to the historical record. Eventually, this is a quotation of, again from the 14th century, after diligent inquiry and examination, he discovered, we'll see who he was in a moment, the fraud and how the said cloth had been cunningly painted, the truth being attested by the artist who had painted it, to wit, that it was a work of human skill and not miraculously wrought or bestowed. This is a quotation from the Bishop of Troyes, in 1389, describing the efforts of his predecessor to halt the exhibition of the shroud in 1356. So it was already controversial back in the 14th century, and then later on it was acquired by the cathedral in Torino. Now, again, one of the, one of the signs of good science is that you can have independent verification. Ten years, nine years actually, after Macron reached this conclusion, it was dated by carbon dating. Carbon dating is, is the accepted way these days. It's hard to, there was a Nobel Prize awarded for carbon dating, by the way. Okay. And how was this done? Three laboratories, they got their samples, again, from uh, STIRP. <coughs> Three laboratories, well-known, prominent laboratories in carbon dating, and they independently determined the date of the shroud to be 1325, plus or minus 65 years. In total concert with Macron's conclusion. <clears throat> this, was con this was confirmation, but his, remember what he did, he used polarized light microscopy and the chemistry, these tests that he carried out under the microscope. Now, <clears throat> Macron's work and his conclusion was not always accepted with magnanimity. He received a postcard as follows. Old man Walter C. Macron is an incompetent, senile old fart who belongs in the nuthouse. That old fraud fudges data and misinterprets on an unprecedented scale. Signed, Citizens for Scientific Honesty. And of course, Macron had a wonderful sense of humor. I, knew, I actually knew him personally. I took a course with him. And he viewed that with good humor. I acknowledge the correctness of one word in that postcard, but it's not that one. I am not young anymore, but I'm young enough to promise to stick around in continuing good health until someone sends me another postcard saying, by golly, you and your microscope were right all along. OK. I want to close by coming back to good science and bad science, as described by another, another uh, great scientist, Carl Sagan. They've renewed his series on, the, on television now, Cosmos. Now, he called this his baloney detection kit. And now, now I want you to, we'll go through the, the, the conditions of his baloney, baloney de detection kit, the tools of this kit, and you think about, I want you to think about what uh, Macron's experiments, how they, if they met with these criteria or not. Whenever possible, there must be independent confirmation of the facts. Encourage substantive debate on the evidence by knowledgeable proponents of all points of view. 
Arguments from authority carry little weight. In science, there are no authorities. Spin more than one hypothesis. Don't simply run with the first idea that caught your fancy. Try not to get overly attached to a hypothesis just because it's yours. Quantify whenever possible. If there's a chain of argument, every link in the chain must work. Occam's razor. If there are two hypotheses that explain the data equally well, choose the simpler. Ask whether the hypothesis can, at least in principle, be falsified. It's the idea of Thomas Kuhn. Shown to be false by some unambiguous test. In other words, is it testable? Can others duplicate the experiment and get the same result? And we saw what happened with the superconductivity. Everybody could repeat it and get the same result. And the question is, could everybody in this room go back and do the same test that Macron did and get the same result? OK. That's pretty much what I have to say. But we have to remember what we're talking about. We're talking about what's considered a sacred religious relic. And are we, we going to believe in it or not believe in it? And in the end, it comes down to science versus faith or faith versus science. And many of us tend to believe in things that even subconsciously you may know are not, they're not real. There's no basis for it. But I think it's in human nature to want to do that. Hope springs eternal. This is a nice quote from a professor at the University of Virginia. In fact, perhaps the most significant revelation to come from the study of the shroud is the demonstration that the practice of science is a very human activity. And you could see how Macron's emotions changed as he went through this whole investigation. When high technology meets the spiritual, it is very difficult to keep the lines between scientific proof and belief drawn. Thank you very much. Did you see that documentary that's been going around, um, uh, which is the guy was doing a reconstruction of the, from the image of Jesus? And he came up with sort of carbon dating and so on. I mean, have you? I, I, I viewed that a while back. Um, again, I mean, you know, what, what, what's, the, if, what's the evidence? Is there any other evidence that that's, that's, that that's what happened? I, mean, here, I think, I think the, the chemical evidence here is, 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 is I don't want to, I'm not sure it's overwhelming, but it's, it's, it's quite convincing. And, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe you could do it some other way, but uh, I'm, I, I wasn't, I did see that, I wasn't convinced by it. I wanted to talk about the bad science, good science point that you made, how um, eventually you'll always, within the scientific community at least, you will always come back and find what the real science is, and the ultimate cost would be time or maybe a lot of cost. But I think the danger is when that bad science is on the verge of between scientists and public, as opposed to just scientific work. And for example, the the the, the issue with the autism and uh, I was, that's exactly the, the example I was going to give. It's it's the impact of bad science when it's on the verge of public, um, uh, I don't know what public health or or when it's talking to public versus right. talking among scientists, is very dangerous. I absolutely, 100% agree with you, and I think, and I think the, 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 that, autism, the, that autism case was, was, was terrible. And now it's, of course, been debunked, and they've retracted the, the paper. But it's and, very and, hard to convince. Well, it, took ten, it took 10 years, and it caused it, it not, it, it, I mean, not only was the science bad, but it caused a tremendous amount of damage because many mothers refused to have their children inoculated. And, and okay, they may have felt that their, their children were protected because everyone else was inoculated. That's sort of what goes, goes on in their minds. But this is, this is very, very dangerous. And I, what, what brought that, there's a, there's a wonder, I don't know if you know the book, there's a book by Ben Goldacre called Bad Science. And he describes this in great detail. 
And he actually, he, he, it, it was actually published just a couple of weeks before, before the thing was essentially debunked. And uh, there's, there's, the, the, that story is, is it's right, terrible. Right, but the key to that story is that the first publication by the clinician who actually was not even a scientific journal. I've, so that's where I was trying to say that there should be some responsibility on the whoever, you know, public, publish ha publishing houses right. or something to kind of not take on such you're, science you're, without being peer reviewed or. And, and one of the things that Goldacre points out is that a lot of the a lot of a lot of the science and the, the publicity and the quote knowledge that we get comes from people who don't have any understanding of it at all, and it comes from newspaper m newspaper people who are, have no scientific training. Right. And 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 this has become very dramatic news, and it's a it's a sound bit on television, and everybody remembers it. And nobody thinks about what the ramifications are and what the basis for these. We all, you know, probably once a week we all hear about what's what's good to eat and what's not good to eat, and 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 then 20 years later we hear well it's not so bad, uh, and and this has a lot to do with how how scientists how scientists report and how especially the press uh, picks up and 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 reports it. Uh, obviously, you're a chemist. I, I um, came across the Turin Shroud last time um, when I was studying archaeology. Oh, okay. Um, so from a different angle, I mean, you mentioned the carbon dating. Um, I'm aware of the fact that um, some people have gone to tremendous lengths to try and discredit the radiocarbon dates. They have. Um, suggesting that earthquakes and things as such right. could, <laughs> could uh, uh, remarkably sort of adjust the dating. I'm wondering if um, there is any suggestions or in intentions to, to, to re-carbon date the shroud because, I mean, since 1989, there have been quite significant improvements in carbon dating techniques, I believe. I, I, I recently saw another paper. Uh, they didn't redate it, but they, but they, 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 checked, they checked all the data that those three institutions then came up with the conclusion there, was, there were no errors, there right. were, the sampling was, was correct, and and all of that was perfectly legitimate. Uh, it's, hard to, it's hard to argue with carbon dating. It really is. Mm -hmm. and, and, and remember, one of the things, all, all the things that you described, criticizing it, are exactly what Langler said, fantastic theories that have also, fantastic about you know, make, making the shroud, fantastic theories which, which, uh, you know, which border almost on the absurd. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's hard to argue with it.